away from the teachings of their prophets, then those teachings get replaced with creative, weird practices. That nobody understands where they came from, but they follow them. And they think somehow uh, the, the help of Allah will come when they follow these weird, strange, inexplicable kinds of rituals. Let's turn the lights off and dance. And Allah will be happy with us. You know, let's make strange sounds in a room and jump around in circles. And somehow this will bring about the pleasure of Allah. The farther you get from the teachings of your prophets, the more the stranger practices enter into your religion. You know, and you have parts of the Muslim world today where Muslims are really into things like, oh man, I need to go to this guy, he can do some magic for me, or they can find, they can call a jinn so that they can, you know, cause these two to get divorced or whatever else. These are the exact things that Bani Israel used to do. Exactly this stuff. And now you find so many Muslims caught up in this nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And they're not only caught up in it, when they are immersed in these kinds of ignorant, you know, deviated practices, cult-like practices, when you remove them from them, they become like emotionally disabled, like disturbed. Like they're really, they're very like emotional and uh, super possessive and protective of these practices. You can't even say anything about them. There are places in the world, Muslim world, where people openly make sajda in front of graves. Openly. With no shame whatsoever. They just make sajda right in front of the graves. And if you go there and you just say one thing about, you know, لِلَّهِ يَسْجُدُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Sajda is only done before Allah. And you don't have to go to a special place and ask for, and make slaughter. You don't make dua to dead people. You don't go in front of people who have passed away and say, because of your goodness, do this, that, that or the other. What, what are you doing? What are you, what, what, where did you get this? Where did this come from? You know? And questioning it can get you killed. They're that mindless. Questioning it can get you killed. You know? What is the solution to all of this? The solution to all of it is not questioning it. The solution to all of it is to bring back a love of Allah's book. Because when you bring people back to the love of Allah's book, then this filth starts going away on its own. They were worshipping the calf. What did Musa salam come back with? He came back with Allah's book, Torah. He came back with Torah. And Torah was the means by which they wouldn't fall into this, this mess again. We are so far from Qur'an now that it's no surprise that these things are happening. I can guarantee you, people that are involved in these practices have never deeply taken a look at the Fatiha. They've never truly taken a look at Surah Al-Ikhlas. They've never gone through even a little bit of Surah Al-Baqarah. Why? Because as you go through Qur'an, you know what happens? You zakihim. It starts purifying people. It starts purifying the way they think. It starts purifying their feelings and their emotions. They on their own come to the realization that these things are wrong. The wrong approach is to actually say, this is haram, this is shirk, this is bad, this is bid'ah. You can say that all you want. They're gonna become even more defensive and do it even more. That is not gonna solve anybody's problem. And you say, at least I did Amr bil ma'roof and nahi ala munka. <laughs> Ullu. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to go to those people and say, hey, let's study the Fatiha. Hey, let's learn something about Surah Al-Baqarah. Hey, let's learn, let's study Ali Imran. Why? Because Allah put even those who have fallen into shirk in some way or the other, or fallen into weird, ritualistic, cultish kinds of practices, even those people, at the end of the day, in the heart of every Muslim, somewhere, some corner is there that has love of Qur'an. That has love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And you can, you can tap into that love and replace it with something, and grow that positive. And when you grow that, then the negative starts disappearing on its own. Our problem is, I get, I get a thousand emails, I get lots of emails. Brother, why don't you ever speak against this issue, or this issue, or this issue, or this issue? Why don't you ever criticize the Muslims for what they do over here, and over here, and over here, and this cult, and that group, and this? I was like, I just teach Qur'an, man. It's like the people of Mecca were doing all kinds of bad stuff. And the solution for all the bad stuff was what? It's Qur'an. Why are you, why are you thinking it's not enough? Allah says, أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِهِمْ أَنَّا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ يُطْلَعَ عَلَيْهِمْ Isn't it enough for them that we've sent the book being read on to them? Isn't it enough for them? Like, that's Allah's way of saying, whatever the problems, if the problem is related to guidance, Qur'an is enough. The entire mission of the Messenger وسلم, summarized in يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He just recites his ayat. He just tells people of the, of the ayat of Allah and through it purifies them. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّبُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ That's all it takes. 
So we have to become students of the Qur'an, we have to become carriers of the Qur'an, and let the Qur'an clean what is inside the hearts on its own.